the benefit of all attendees. Thank you. And um, if anyone in the room uh, wants to ask any question, I would ask the person to come up here and speak, use the microphone to ask questions. So our first speaker is Patricia McGinn. She's online. Patricia. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers to give the opportunity to, to speak remotely, although I would really have loved to be there with you all. Um, so I'm going to talk today about uh, a bit the European Open Science Cloud, the EOSC, and uh, how uh, our activity in biodiversity informatics uh, helped and was a success story to, to progress on the implementation of uh, the EOSC. Oh. There's some lag. Okay. So first, uh, for those of you who may not have heard yet of the European Open Science Cloud, um, it's a large European initiative that wants to provide the researchers, inventors, companies, citizens with a federated and open multidisciplinary environment where they can publish, find, and reuse data, tools, services for research, innovation, and educational purpose. So their goals are quite close to what our community is doing with the difference that they are uh, not domain specific, but want to be multidisciplinary, touching all possible sciences. Their motto is as open as possible, as close as necessary. Because over the years when we worked, we noticed that although we would all like to have open and free data to all, we have to be realistic. And in some cases, it was necessary that some data were not open, but to have them on board. That's why they promoted the well-known uh, FAIR principle to have the data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And since July 2020, there is also the EOSC Association, which was established as a legal entity to govern the implementation and the follow-up of the, the EOSC. Um, so there has been work before uh, on defining an EOSC recommended structure, where they defined three major components, the EOSC uh, core, which contains the minimum sets of components necessary to have a minimum viable EOSC so that the researcher can discover, share, access, and reuse the data and services. Then there is an additional layer that is the EOSC exchange, which is a sort of marketplace and catalog with all kinds of services on top of the EOSC core that can be extended to be used by a wider public and private provider. And then, of course, they also need an EOSC data federation to access the data. I will come back in further slides to that because, of course, we all have also data federations that need to be accessed here. If you want to have further reading on these different components that will uh, make the structure of EOSC, I recommend to read the Fair Lady report uh, done in 2020 by the European Commission and of which I provided the light the link in this presentation. Um, the EOSC Association, so uh, created uh, in 2020, uh, is the result of a long-term strategic agenda for implementing EOSC that uh, started even before 2015, but there, there was a big work done together with the European Commission and the member states to align the different initiatives. During the initial phase uh, that led to the creation of the association and the partnership with the European Commission for the implementation of the minimum viable EOSC uh, was also uh, an activity where my colleagues and myself were involved together with the EOSC Secretariat. And now the EOSC Association up and running uh, is working on the strategic research and innovation agenda, the SRIA, defining the work program and the priorities for the next steps of EOSC. Currently, they have 145 voting members, 64 observers, and with a membership fee as of spring 2022, 20, this represents 
55 million, let alone with the uh, uh, memberships uh, fees to the association. You can check out their website. One of the major components of the association is the uh, large number of advisory groups and task force, which to some extent already existed during the initial phase. And uh, they continued uh, uh, in the transition in the EOSC association to build on that work and continue on the long term to, to advise on the implementation of the, the EOSC in future. Uh, my colleagues, uh, fellow colleagues, uh, presenters and groups are in the active, uh, advisory group sustaining EOSC, which has as goal the long-term survival of the EOSC to implement a scalable and sustainable ecosystem that will include also funding models uh, and also how to include the national uh, public funding, the thematic research infrastructures, and also different uh, other government structures and policies, including EU projects. Uh, there are two task forces within, one that is specifically on financial sustainable uh, models to have this viable model on the long term, and the other is more technical on the long term data preservation. Uh, my colleagues and myself are in the financial sustainability task force, of which objective is really not just to put a price tag uh, on the different components, but also understand how we can bring in the community, how to convince uh, the funding bodies and the, the user community to buy in all the different components of the EOSC I presented before, and how to, to have the, the FAIR principle implemented and how to be convincing that this is continued on the longer term after the, the initial funding phases. Uh, in this task force, we have those three uh, work streams and uh, I was active most in the data federation work stream. Although, uh, of course, we dialogued also with the others and also with the, the other um, advisory groups to be on the same line. And we identified, of course, that there are many already existing data federations with a long history of uh, successes and lessons learned. And notably in the environmental science, molecular science, uh, biodiversity, and also social science and humanities, these are certainly group we have to work with. And we analyzed and did case studies and success stories within our advisory reports so that this is taken into account in the implementation of EOSC. And the goal is by no means to do here any uh, reinvent of the wheel or to replace this existing successful initiative, but really to work with these thematic platforms together so that users can access uh, hopefully a multidisciplinary uh, platform. Uh, so, as you can see, there are many cross-cutting issues and all the terms you can see, for example, for implementing the minimum viable EOSC, they speak of persistent identifier of metadata, of data quality, interoperably EI, data services, standards, semantic and technical interoperability, and of course, the FAIR principles. If you look at the already uh, Partially their EOSC portal catalog and marketplace, you see that they are divided either in different uh, scientific disciplines or in different categories, being it infrastructures or aggregators or federations, etc. And the idea is to uh, expand this. And uh, I provided here also the links so that you can go further look into it. Uh, it is almost from self-speaking when we see it that we need a reinforced collaboration between EOSC and what I would call TEDWIC, but it goes much more than TEDWIC. Thinking here also, of course, of GBIF, of PHL, uh, Catalog of Life, uh, CTAF, uh, all the research infrastructure like uh, uh, Disco or Bicycle. We presented also in the report to the EOSC uh, advisory group, the ongoing activities of the bicycle projects that is also very much in line with uh, what we try to achieve here. And that's why we would really like, uh, although there are already many uh, 
with the research data alliance and many other activities linked between what I would say the biodiversity and natural history community and the EOS, there are ways to make that a bit more structured and a bit more formalized. And so we would like to suggest that we try to make maybe MOUs or collaboration agreements now that there is this large EOSC association. We think it would benefit both to EOSC and TEDWIC and our community to, to work here uh, in a more structured and systematic way together. For the EOSC, it would be really a fantastic opportunity to uh, benefit from our long-term experience and from all the tools, services, and standards we develop, um, and to be also together in the different uh, task groups and uh, activity and uh, advisory groups to, to exchange when we do reports and position papers and advices. And also for us, uh, the, the our community, it could be to broaden our user base and uh, see if the tools we are developing are also interesting for uh, to be used by other disciplines like reaching out humanities, social sciences, physics or chemistry or many other research infrastructure that are in the uh, scope of the, the, the larger EOS multidisciplinary approach. There are, of course, added value, but also challenges to this approach. Necessarily, if we want to dialogue with other disciplines, we will have to simplify probably our la language. We will have to make more efforts to clarify our definitions, avoid misunderstandings where the same terms used may have other meanings or other semantics in other domain to avoid misunderstanding and to have a genuine, efficient collaboration. We have also to be clear here and uh, address together fundamental aspects of our user base. For example, in the EOS groups, we discussed very openly why would, for example, users from our large community that use GB for so long that are now developing Disco go to EOS and what would be the added value or would they simply stay with their thematic, how can we convince what can be the meaningful additional services cross-disciplinary to have uh, users go to EOSC versus uh, staying in their already up and running uh, infrastructures. Uh, also, will the users come one time through the EOSC to discover new services? And once they are find them, will they go back to EOSC or will they go directly to the thematic where they found their happiness in services. How can they on the long term, which is the, the, the goal of our group, keep the users at the EOSC level and have meaningful uh, cross-disciplinary offers there? Of course, TEDWIC here can play a very important role because we really need common standards, controlled vocabularies from the different disciplines to really have a meaningful, interoperable and uh, accessible data federations here and to, to really implement the, the, the FAIR principle as uh, EOSC and also our whole scientific community in the different research infrastructure are investing. So for the next step, um, we would like to suggest that our community exchanges with the EOSC association to see how we can contribute to them. We can also become member of our respective associations. Uh, if you want to be a voting member, it's 10,000 euro in EOSC. Uh, if you want to be observer non-voting where you have access to all, it's 3,000 euro. That's for example, what the, the garden decided to do. You can also participate to upcoming events to present uh, relevant activities of our community to the EOS community. There is the EOS annual symposium in November in Prague and the EOS general assembly uh, number five will be online also end of November. And we also dreamed why not have a large TEDWIC EOS, uh, maybe again like Biodiversity Next, large con multidisciplinary conference in Europe for the next uh, TEDWIC iteration, maybe in 25 or uh, 26. So if any European town is interested in this, by all means, uh, let me know with my other hat on of the uh, time and place uh, 
chair of the, the TEDWIC executive. Uh, for the end, I would also like to, to thank, uh, of course, the member of the EOS advisory groups and task force who are for most people with other jobs uh, like us, also uh, who put a lot of work in compiling all these documents and providing uh, advice and with sometimes very tight deadline. The EOSC Association Board and Secretariat, who really helped also to get some figures and supported our initiative here. And I would also like to thank uh, the Belgian uh, and Flemish and French uh, speaking and uh, federal uh, implementation of the local uh, European science um, uh, in Belgium because uh, they enabled also to, to nominate me to be in these international groups of EOSC and uh, also my colleagues in Meise who are also involved in the different EOSC uh, related uh, groups at Belgian level. And uh, we liaise also a lot with Disco Flanders uh, because uh, in, uh, at local level uh, in Belgium, they really want to avoid uh, double funding and uh, they want to have a genuine collaboration between the research infrastructures and the, the EOSC implementation locally and see how we can really efficiently uh, pool these different resources that we have to, to make something about it. It would be too long now at another presentation to, to explain this, but uh, we did invite uh, quite some uh, colleagues from our wider Tadwick and GBIF community to present the development there. And we really put all means that our development from the our wider community is taken into account in the EOSC. And we also transmit that at EU and international level to them so that our biodiversity and natural history community is really taken into account in all this development and our efforts valorized. So I thank you for your attention and I will be uh, still online and uh, also a bit in Slack and the chat if you have any questions. Thank you, Patricia. I think we are running out of time and maybe we can put the question on the Slack or and if you're still online. Yeah. Um, if we can save some time, maybe we can answer to the in-person questions. So mm -hmm. next person is Marike Peterson. Um, she's the chair of the Outreach and Communication Subcommittee uh, in Chadwick. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the... <laughs> okay. Thank you for the introduction. Um, as Sari mentioned, I'm currently leading um, the Functional Subcommittee Outreach of, and Communication. And I think it's a great follow-up from, from Patricia's talk on further collaboration and being clear what an organization really would like to do. And, what an organization is working on. And this is really important. And I think from time to time, each organization needs to reflect on itself, whether we are communicating in the right way, whether we are really conveying on our website, on our, our, in our presentation, what we are really doing and what we are aiming for. And uh, for this reason, the subcommittee outreach and communication put some effort in this uh, in the last couple of years, months, it was more or less one and a half year. So first of all, what do we have currently? So we have Tedwick. Tedwick, most of you know that, but this is actually just the abbreviation of our old name, which is Taxonomic um, Database Working Group. But everybody is using that abbreviation. 
and um, we are still it's a bit ch a challenge with the our new it's not really new but our new title which is biodiversity information standards it's not commonly used and especially the abbreviation this is not commonly used but i think you will be you will hear a bit more about our history in our final presentation on friday yes it's on friday um so i think that's already kind of good so we have a name at least but there is some improvement um, we have a really comprehensive website, tedwick.org. There's a lot of information on that. But since there is a lot of information, it's really difficult to find the different key values of our organization. So there's no official mission or vision statement what the organization is really doing. We have some corporate identity on the website, at least some colors, and we have a logo, but the logo is just some text. So, and this is really difficult. So we are not conveying what we are doing in our um, logo itself. So um, for that reasons, um, we sat down as a functional subcommittee um, one and a half years ago and sat setting up a communication strategy for Tedwick. Um, luckily we had a senior communication officer on board. He's still on board. Um, Jose Alonso from Leiden, who helped us also with the template and um, collecting all the different um, things we need for this kind of communication strategy. So first of all, uh, we were collecting our key messages, which are somewhere hidden in our, on our website, which we are usually adding to our um, talks and presentations. This was done by us as a subcommittee but always supplemented uh, with ideas from the executive committee from Tedwick. And then we were thinking about our audience. So who are the stakeholders we are talking with? Who are the take stakeholders we should collaborate with? And um, together we set up some draft vision and mission statements. Um, and then we sent them out to review to you. So to our community, whether they really convey what Tedwick is doing, whether there is something which is misleading, whether we should add something and so on. And um, then of course we had some, some review process, some internal review process. And this is what they are now are. Our mission is creating, maintaining, and promoting open community-driven standards to enable sharing and use of biodiversity data for all. And one of the first use cases is already our roll-up just in front of that um, room here today. And our vision is open, free, and interconnected biodiversity knowledge. And I think it's the same what Patricia said, what uh, GBIF has in common. So this is all more or less the same vision we all have in mind. And I think this would be great to collaborate further also on this kind of strategic development. The second thing is you already see it here um, in the roll up and you have seen it already on the some of the opening slides is that we were also reconsidering our TEDWIC logo. So what we had was just a kind of couple of letters. Um, and uh, it's kind of limited in its usability. It's also difficult for other people to remember how the Tedrick logo might look like on presentation because it's just text. And we also had some difficulties with that font because it was a font which is not openly available. So you couldn't add this to any of your presentations, etc. And I think we already had a great effort in all the different years for conference logos. And they all looked great, but they all started from scratch developing a new one. And so they all looked a bit different. And it was difficult to see that this is really a Tetric conference, just apart from the Tetric letters. Um, so again, as a, um, as a community-driven organization, we asked you, our community, is should we change our logo? And the answer was, yes, please do so. Um, but should we stick to the letters Tedwick? And the answer was, yes, please do so, because this is, this is our brand. Um, so then uh, we were reviewing all those kind of different feedbacks in our working group meeting just after last year's conference. And we decided, well, we should really work on a, the development of a new logo. 
But at the same time, everybody will do so many different things. Um, we also decided that we will need some professional help. So we reached out to an external developer um, who knows how NGOs work and that they are really limited uh, in funding. Um, so that we really um, would like to have just a logo and not a whole corporate identity and design things, just simply a logo. And I think this was really helpful. And right from the beginning on, um, he provided some, some nice suggestions uh, where we could work on. And then we um, discussed this internally, but also some final discussions with our executive committee, of course. And um, you already have seen, this is the final result of our new Tedwick logo. It conveys on the left-hand side, more or less the globe, the world, we are a global, uh, global organization. And on the very left side, you have this kind of unsorted data, unsorted information. And through us, through the organization Tetrix, so the brand Tetrix, same color, it gets sorted all the information types according to our standards. And on the right-hand side, you have the full title Biodiversity Information Standards plus our brand Tetrix. And uh, the colors are not new. These are the same colors we have used before for our logo. And also the font is now um, freely available even in Google Slides. But of course, we didn't only provide one logo. Um, we have different shapes for different use cases. Um, uh, we have also now a kind of Fevercon, which will be then used in our browser so that you know that you are on the Chadwick website. Um, we have hexagon stickers um, in both colors, but we also use this kind of monochrome version. And they are already, thanks to Stan, available on the website now. So you can download them and use them for your new presentations. You have, so, you have two minutes. Yes, that's it. So <clears throat> that's um, what we have done in the last one and a half years. So we started with a communication strategy, set up some key messages and um, discussed who are our main stakeholders, um, who do we need to talk to and who do we need to talk with. And this resulted in our, our new mission and vision statements, um, the new logo design, but this is all just a foundation for some strategic planning. So this had it to be done. This was all led by the functional um, subcommittee outreach and communication. And I think it was really important that having several people on board pushing different things and leading on that, having some senior communication expertise on board and a whole team which is really motivated and open-minded. So I really thank my whole subcommittee for, for um, following up on this. But uh, to all different steps, we invited the whole community um, for feedback. And I think this was likewise important also to have some for at least final decision, the executive committee on board. But also um, inviting external experts is, I think, really important, like for our logo and um, development. With this, I would like to thank you very much. Um, I thank Rico Reinhold, who developed our logo. He's actually German, but he lives in Australia. So this is kind of a global approach already. And it was really helpful. And I, I thank Stan, who just already published the logos our, on our website, and Peter, who is already thinking about new color codes for our website. So that's really, really um, great. And I actually don't know what to do with my laptop now, whether I need to peel off the old logo or whether this should be stick to my old laptop to see a bit the history of Tedrick as well. Thank you. Thank you, Marike. Um, are there any questions in the audience? Which one? There is no question but a comment, and we put it on the Slack, so maybe we can. Thank you, Mariki. Um, so our next speaker is Matthias Dillen, and he will be talking about calculating the digitization level of specimen with the minimum information about a digital specimen. Standards, MITS. No. 
Can everybody hear me? Ah, okay. Now let me find the presentation. Yep, okay. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Matthias Dillon from My Botanic Garden, and I'm going to talk to you about myths. Um, myths has already been discussed earlier today by Elspeth in the other room. Um, but what I want to talk about specifically in this presentation is how to actually calculate myths to actually implement it in practice. And I will uh, illustrate it with some of the work that we've been doing at the garden in this regard. So first, very briefly, what is MITS? If you're not aware of it, MITS is an acronym for minimum information about digital specimen. It is a standard that is currently in development where we try to list the data elements that a natural history specimen is supposed to show um, when it's digitally available to achieve a certain level of digitization. So it is a way to quantify the digitization status of a specimen when it has been digitized. We distinguish four different levels. You can see them on the slide. I'm not going to go into all the details because Elspeth has already covered those. Um, I do want to reiterate a bit the sort of major aims that MITS has as a standard. And quite principally, that is to guide digitization strategies. So by listing those different elements, we indicate which properties for such specimens are important and which ones are less so. And we have also some sort of track towards more um, extensive digitized specimens going from bare to extended. The second thing, and also quite important, is to be able to quantify the status at the specimen level. So we can see for collections, but also for other groupings, such as certain taxonomic groups or certain collectors of points in time and space, how well digitized these have been and what work is still there to do. And as a sort of side effect that could be quite nice from it as well, is that we're going to have to make some cutoff decisions about these levels. And this can has a significant chance of promoting interoperability, um, which is always a nice thing to have. So the current status of MITS is that we have monthly task group meetings. If you want to join these, you can contact the conveners. Um, to, be, to give a very brief summary, currently uh, level zero and one have been more or less accepted in the latest draft. Uh, level two is currently being discussed and level three is something that we have yet to discuss. So all this talk about a calculation that I'm going to do later in this presentation has some more provisional mappings for levels two and three because I'm not set in stone yet. Um, so this illustrates where we have gotten now in terms of uh, the MITS elements for zero and one. And it also includes uh, for Darwin Core some provisional mappings of how these properties could be mapped in practice to a data standard as this used, for instance, at GBIF. But this is not explicitly so. This, there can be some ambiguity in what is acceptable for these different mappings. So this leads to the question of how do we actually monitor these scores? How do we actually calculate them? And this is a question that's maybe being asked a bit too late because MITS has already been implemented in surveys in dashboards to sort of suggest what the digitization status is for different collections, often at the national level. But these statistics have been assessed at the collection level, not a specimen level. They're often rough guesstimates based on digitization projects and not on the specimen data themselves. And that makes it more difficult to do this in repeated ways and to have a track of how well digitization is progressing. And in particular of how digitization is progress is progressing um, across different collections around the world. So what is actually needed to make this work in a repeatable manner is a calculation method that is not ambiguous and it can be repeated easily across different collections in different methods, uh, different calculations, scripts, and tools. So what is effectively required is that we have explicit mappings to the standards that are being used in schemas that are not hard-coded in certain applications that can be easily transferred across different um, collections and different uh, aggregators and different databases. We need to make some hard decisions as well on what values we consider to be um, acceptable to con constitute a digitization, uh, because we know for a fact that some values that we see in data sets do not indicate a positive answer to the question, has this piece of data actually been digitized? They are artifacts of databases, or they're just placeholder values. And of course, in the end, we also need some scripts and tools implemented um, in pipelines and workflows that actually do the calculation itself, because we're not going to do it manually. Um, this brings us to the work that we've been doing at the garden in this regard. So it 
takes more or less a twofold approach. The first thing we built was a schema, a JSON schema that explicitly maps the MITS elements, the ones that are currently accepted and provisionally some at the higher levels that are not set in stone yet, to, in this case, properties in Darwin Core archives. So using this mapping, you can come up with scripts that obviously lead to the same outcome from, uh, for different, uh, also always lead to the same outcome, even with different applications for the same data sets. So you can do repeated calculations of MIT scores. Um, in addition to these mappings, it also includes provision for mapping these known unknown values. Um, I'm not sure if it's well visible on the slide, maybe a bit too small, but for some properties and also generically, we included some um, values that we don't accept as positive answers to the question if it's, it is digitized. So things like um, empty strings and values of unknown and the like. Um, there is a link there to the repository where the schema is, is part. There's also a link in the slide if you uh, consult the slides later on. All the code that we have in the schema itself are fully open. But this repository also includes a second thing that we made, which is a tool that does the calculation. Because we wanted not just to have the schema, but also make it possible for anyone to do the calculation and get MITS levels for their data set as well. So we made an R Shiny app that enables this. And it just takes a GBIF annotated Darwin Core archive that you upload into the app. And with the press of a button, you get the results of your MITS calculation. It also includes the functionality where you can, within the app, modify the schema that does the mapping to the, the Darwin Core terms. So you can play around with it a bit, which is very relevant for the upper mids levels, which are not set in stone yet. You can remove the mappings. You can add uh, uh, different ones. You can change them from different mids levels if you want to, without having to dig through the actual raw JSON file. And this is what the results look like. So you get a breakdown of your scores across the different mids levels. You can also obviously export the, the actual scores that are being calculated. And you also get an indication of why certain levels were not met. Uh, in this example on the slide, this is um, a calculation done for a GBIF download with all preserved specimens with country code for Bulgaria. And as you can see, most of them are still at mid zero according to this schema mapping. And this is primarily because of a combination of a lack of object type and modified mapping. So they're either missing a timestamp of when they were latest modified, at least at the individual specimen level, or and or they have um, no explicit mention of what sort of specimen they are. We know they are specimen, they preserve specimen, but we have no further clear uh, answer to the question of what sort of thing they are, a barium sheet, a pint insect, a stuffed animal, it can be anything. Um, so with this app, it makes doing the calculation um, possible for anyone, even if they don't have the programming experience. On the slide, you can also see a YouTube link to a video that uh, demos the app and makes it a bit more clear, uh, done by my colleague, Lynn, who also did quite a lot of the coding for this shiny app. Um, and so finally, yes, uh, I wanted to list some of the still outstanding challenges, which can also be considered invitations to others to collaborate on this project and push it further so that MITS actually becomes a thing that is being used. Um, First of all is the accessibility of the app. It's all open on GitHub. It's a shiny R app. Um, not everyone is familiar with that. So we also made an installer that primarily works for Windows built using the Ino application. And the other way currently to run it is to download the code and run it using a local R instance. So we don't have a web app. We don't have any containers. That is something that we could build on to make it more easy for others to run. Um, but there are some performance considerations because we are working with sometimes fairly big Darwin Core archives that have to be uploaded into it and processed. So it's not so easy to build an open web app for this. Um, the second thing is that MITS, of course, is not set in stone yet. It's still in development. So the provisional schema that we have that comes with the app now for levels two and three is just a bit of an, uh, a guess from, from our end and not something that's come from the official MITS documentation. Um, it's currently just for Darwin Core archives, so we would want to extend this to ABCD and some other standards possibly, and also include some Darwin Core extensions, because these are getting more and more prominence, and some may be very relevant for especially the higher level MITS elements. And we will also probably need in the end some different schemas for different uh, fields and different types of specimens, in particular in the MITS discussions we've had, we found that for paleontology and geology, 
we won't be able to use the same mappings as we do for um, biological specimens. And that is most of what I wanted to say. And I'll um, answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Matthias. <laughs> Okay, uh, we have time for questions. Are there any questions in the room? Thank you. Um, Elsa Tasman. Um, I, I mean, I, I love it. Um, it would be great if it were possible for it to be um, online, that people could just use it. Mm -hmm. um, whether it could run with a GBIF um, app, or API, sorry, um, or the GeoCase. I don't know if GeoCase has an API that this could work with. Um, but is that something that could be possible in the future? Um, I would think so. It depends a bit on, of course, how these infrastructures see it and how they're technically set up to support it. The code is all currently in R that may not be suitable for some applications in terms of performance and in terms of compatibility with your technical setup. Um, but there are possibly ways around. And it's not like the code is that complicated that it can be ported to, to other uh, platforms. Um, so, no, I don't see any key obstacles, but it would be good if people could already test this application to see how it works and to get some feedback so that we can also work on it from that and before we start implementing it into um, actual production workflows. Thank you. Uh, um, Tim Robertson online, he's ready. Thank you. Hi, Matthias. It's nice to see you. Um, at GBIF, we'd be very happy to, to port your algorithm and calculate um, MITs. Um, if it is of interest to, to you and Elspeth and the people who've worked on it. Um, if, if you would like that, um, please just, just let us know and, and we could add a, a MITS calculation um, for, the, for the data that, that we see, um, either by using your code or, or porting it into, into our um, framework. But that's an implementation detail. Thank you. Thank you for the offer, Tim. Um, yeah, I think we can easily get in touch and we can discuss it further. Thank you, Tim. Okay. Time is already gone. So now our next speaker, Holly Little. She's going to talk about her paleontologic work, but she's also our North American representative in Chadwick Executive Committee. For this microphone. <laughs> Stop me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Holly Little. I'm the informatics manager in the Department of Paleobiology at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. I'm here today speaking on behalf of my colleagues listed here, as well as the larger paleo data working group that we all participate in. This group was formed in 2020 um, as the next phase of a longstanding community of practice addressing digitization and data in paleo collections. This current group really focuses mostly on the implementation of data standards, looking at local institutional practices and improving global coordination and solutions. All right. Um, so our community has been on quite a journey over the last few years, looking at these nuances and issues in our data, particularly once it's aggregated and mobilized. Taxonomy is of course a very key aspect of this. Um, although the paleo data that we have covers the entirety of um, 
past life, the nuances and challenges in that taxonomy and the uncertainty and unknowns we often see with paleo specimens don't always lend themselves to the common data structures that we see used in the biodiversity community for taxonomy. Um, and there still remains a lot of questions for how to handle those more paleo-based nuances in the data that we must record. So as the Paleo Data Working Group in the conversations that we've been having internally, but then also with our partners that you see here, uh, the Paleobiology Database, Catalog of Life, GBIF, TaxonWorks, and others, we've been able to spend more time doing a more in-depth investigation into what some of these challenges are and what some possible solutions could be. Obviously, looking mostly to improve the quality and discoverability of our fossil specimen data. Up front, I wanna share one of the key takeaways of this work. And that is that if we're gonna find solutions and best practices to some of these challenges, it's not gonna be done by just one group, not just by our group. And although taxonomists are core to this work, it's not up to them alone as well. We think this is a really important to note that the expertise and perspectives of people like collections managers, data managers, developers, the people maintaining our digital infrastructure, and more are all very important to consider. And it might include many of you in this room, even if you don't currently work with paleo collections. Um, we want to encourage that that variety of perspectives is important for finding new solutions. So the challenges are many and vast. Um, this is one way to look at them. These are just some examples. You could of course pull these apart further. There's parallels, overlaps. You do see some of these in the extant community. Um, but what we're trying to do is look at this in a way that we can pull them apart into manageable chunks and identify those main areas of issue. It's a little bit of a tangled mess, as you can see by our friend in the middle. Um, a useful place to start is actually looking at the metrics that you see applied to the occurrence records as they're ingested into GBIF. Um, so although these are broad areas for the taxonomy, as you can see here, um, they help us to start to pinpoint where we can uh, look at those more specific needs. Uh, you might notice that there's a little bit of a heavier rank, uh, weight for these flags for the fossil specimen records versus preserved specimen records. Of course, we know that these flags are there because GBIF is trying to help normalize our data to improve discoverability. And sometimes that is very helpful. In this case, you can see that the genus, a misspelling was caught. And in the species, um, a name variation was changed. But the range of the interpretations can be very variable. And sometimes they do make changes that maybe aren't as good. Um, or possibly incorrect, or highlight some very important conflicts in the taxonomic information that we're able to um, manage. So in this case, uh, the record contained, con I'm not taxonomist, I apologize for pronunciation, uh, condrictes um, in the original data as a class, and that was replaced as elasmobrinca in the interpreted data. Within the fossil taxonomy, the original is correct, and elasmobranchi is considered a subclass. So this is a case where it's a little uncertain if that change is desirable or not. Oh. Um, so as we look at these changes and we start to understand what is happening in the interpretations, it gives us a way to look at what are those root elements of paleotaxonomy that might be causing these challenges. So the first I wanna share is about scientifically unknown ranks. An inherent part of paleontology is a wide variety of uncertainty and unknowns. Um, you often see cases where these mid ranks highlighted in the middle um, maybe aren't even available for a specimen. And that can be just because of conflicts, lack of information, there's a variety of reasons. Um, so what you often see is those are gaps, there's not information there. And the question is, do we leave those blank? Do we use placeholder values? If you're using placeholder values, like the ones here in Certicetus or unknown, often those are used inconsistently. There's different versions. And then the next phase of that is what happens when it's ingested. Sometimes those places where 
an intentionally blank value, like you see in the original data here, is backfilled upon interpretation. Um, and it's uncertain if, the, if that's desirable in this case. Um, and in, in the example you see here, actually by adding that class and doing that backfill, it actually changes the phylum as well. Um, and this is again, another example where the classification is a bit of, has some conflict in it. Um, so we might want to keep that original data to help with the discoverability. The next example of inherent aspects of paleo taxonomy is, of course, a little bit more on the data heavy side, and that is our very heavy use of intermediate ranks. Um, so these do not have equivalent Darwin core terms that we can map to. However, they're heavily used within paleo collections, and we, of course, know that these are used in extant collections as well. Um, but really important groups like ammonites that you see here are discovered within these ranks. So if you have data at subclass or superfamily, but you don't have a way to mobilize that data, then you're losing information and points of discoverability into these specimen records. One place that we can really see evidence of this is in the Darwin core taxon rank term. This term helps to show what the most specific name applied to a specimen is. Um, so if you're looking at an occurrence record and that most specific rank is something like a subclass, but you don't have a Darwin core term to map that data to, and then it's interpreted, um, it inherently may end up losing some of the resolution in what we know about that specimen because it will often get mapped at that higher rank taxa. Um, so if you're looking at a subclass, it will probably get bumped to a class. And um, one thing that we are trying to improve in the paleo collections community is actually using taxon rank. It's not always mapped, only about half of the records in GBIF have it. But then of that 52,000 um, have these intermediate ranks as the lowest rank. And this all comes together to our favorite thing to talk about in paleo, which is clades. Um, clades really start to compound the issue. Um, so this is a way of grouping organisms according to uh, common ancestors. It is somewhat hierarchical, but it doesn't have um, standard ranks in the same way that our Linnaean systems do. And so it doesn't really fit within the digital infrastructure that we all often use. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, that we're all often using. Um, so if you have something like the clade synapsid shown here, the question is, where do you put that data if it doesn't fit within the Linnaean ranks? Um, and often these are floating somewhere in those mid ranks that we've already talked about are very difficult for paleo in some cases. So to show you an example of this, um, if you were trying to take that cladogram that I showed before and show it hierarchically, it would be this version on the left where the clades are in orange. Um, and so then what happens because of the systems that we're using is a lot of paleo collections are actually taking that data and then mapping it to Linnaean ranks just to try to get it to fit somewhere. So they're not actually equivalent. Um, so in the USNM example here, in EMU and then also in our Darwin core mapping, we're putting clades into ranks like class and order, or again, looking at those intermediate ranks of um, superclass, just so that they can get into our databases or get into our mobilized information. But we're creating equivalencies that aren't real and misinterpretations of that data. Um, we do benefit from being able to map to higher classification to share some of that, but actually in this case, synapsida, the one we talked about before, is a critical group for study in paleo, but it doesn't have any discoverability if you're to actually try to find all the synapses in GBIF. Um, and it actually is interpreted to reptiles in this case, which is no longer correct. So underlying all this kind of the through line is of course the taxonomic backbone. And one of the really important pieces, not just for looking at how we can improve our local data practices, but for solving this is how can we improve the backbone to better re represent fossil taxonomy? Um, people often think of the paleobiology database as a resource for being a taxonomic authority in paleo, 
but it actually doesn't act in the same way that something like the World Register of Marine Species does with validation and curation of the information coming in. Um, also with our catalog of life conversations, we learned that because of all the many conflicts that can happen with the classifications, a lot of the data in paleobiology database isn't actually integrated into the backbone because they don't fit the model or they don't fit within other sources of taxonomy. So you only really get groups like trilobites, ammonites, and belemnites, which are extinct groups. So we're having a lot of conversations about what are the authorities used in paleo collections. Um, we have this full range that you see here, anywhere from fully mobilized resources to primarily analog or just not really digitally accessible resources um, that are used within our community. And so what we want to do is try to uh, pull together for specific taxonomic groups, what is the primary resource that we want to use as a community and communicate to our partners to try to better understand how they can fit within the backbone or possibly use tools that we know other groups are developing to extract that data when you're looking at these analog resources. So I've outlined a lot of challenges, but we think there are a lot of really promising paths forward. Within our community, we're working to create a lot of community-driven resources. So again, that list of taxonomic authorities or guidelines and best practices, both for how to record taxonomic information locally, but also how to map and share that information. Um, we're also looking at testing systems to try to understand places where we could do collaborative taxonomic curation of the data that we're all managing separately. Why not do it together um, to look at new possible data models and other things that could be solutions to these issues. And then we want to continue conversations with the stakeholders, maintainers, and partners that I mentioned before and others. And then, of course, the typical Tadwig work, which is looking at Darwin Core and possibly requesting new terms, hopefully for all those intermediate ranks. We feel strongly that this is possible, but it's a moving target um, with changing data standards and changing technologies and capacity. But we think that it's really important to try to get more fox fossil taxonomy represented within these systems uh, to really expand the data that's available and discoverable across our biodiversity ecosphere. Um, and it's of course gonna be a combined effort of all these people and all these organizations. So thank you. If you're interested, um, we invite you to join us for our next happy hour, which will be an extension of this conversation that I've started today. Um, I have stickers if you like our trilicorn. Uh, so yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, thanks, Holly. Are there, is there any question in the room for Holly? We have comments on the chat, but maybe we can put that on Slack and you can answer it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. One question. Hello. Hi. My name is Murray and I work at the GP Secretariat. Thanks for the talk. That was great. Um, I have a question. In your opinion, do you think that it would be better to have just an alternative taxonomy just for paleo, or is it better to try to integrate it with? something that's also encompassing everything else? I, it's a good question. And it's something we've debated a lot because I, I, I think we wanna be able to play in the same space as everybody else, but there are so many challenges and nuances that are specific to fossils that sometimes it is like, maybe we just need to live over here. <laughs> um, I'm hoping maybe there's a hybrid solution possibly. Um, because there, I, there are a lot of people that do study across that boundary of extinct specimens and modern specimens, um, and we wouldn't want to lose the ability to see those two things combined. Yeah. Thank you. So I think we are just on time. Uh, I bet everyone is hungry now, so maybe I can, we can just uh, give a big round of applause to all our speakers. Uh, And I would like to thank Steve and Holly for helping me moderating this session. And bon appétit. 
Yeah, downstairs. Uh, group photo. Okay, thank you.